Welcome to another At Right Angles webinar. As you already know, At Right Angles is a whole school magazine that comes out in March, July, and November. It's published by Azim Prenz University uh, along with uh, Community Mathematics Center, Rishi Valley. We apologize today that uh, Suketu Patni won't be joining us. However, we do have Aman Makija with us. He is a student from Bangalore who just completed his 10th and 12th. He is an aspiring mathematician who loves geometry and linear algebra. He is also an avid stargazer and a music lover. So today he is going to take us to space and back on the surface of Earth and we will keep doing that going back and forth and basically look at various celestial phenomena and uh, the what is happening and use math to understand all of that. Now this is a fairly complex thing where your perspective changes and you know you are in a three-dimensional space so points of reference changes and all those things. So let's see what Aman has in store for us. So Aman, uh, what got you inspired and what are the problems that you tried to solve? Uh, hello everyone. Yeah, so um, I think there are a few things which got me interested in sort of broadly the paths of apparent path of celestial bodies, which is what we'll be discussing. So um, the first is watching the sunrise and sunset. So I live on the 10th floor. Um, so I, I get a very clear view of the horizon. I get to watch the sunrise and set, uh, especially during the dry season, um, almost every day. So it got me thinking because I got to observe the um, path of the sun change uh, day to day up. Uh, over the course of the year. Um, so that's one. A second thing that got me interested in this problem was uh, when I was on a long international flight, often they have this uh, virtual interface where you can see the part of the world that's in daylight and the part that's um, dark, so that that has nighttime. And it's never a clear 50-50 boundary between the part of the world in daylight and the part of the world in night. There's always in asymmetry, unless you're on the unless you're on two very specific days of the year, which are the equinoxes. But other than that, you'll always see that the that uh, if you're in the summer, in, in our summer, the northern hemisphere has more daylight, and during our winter, it has less. It, it's it's completely in dark. That the northernmost part of the of the map. So I was curious as to how you can sort of understand where that that boundary between light and dark um, actually lies. Then I've always had a passion for meteorology and climate data, as well as astronomy. So observing the paths of objects. And if you have a telescope, you get to watch the, you, you have to really move quickly to track um, celestial objects across the sky. So um, let me just show you uh, sort of some, of some of the inspiration for this in the astronomical context. Um, so uh, should I go, should I get into this? Um, sure, go ahead. Wow. Yeah. So here you can see, um, the, these are time-lapse images. So each streak of light here is a single celestial object moving across the sky. And, and so, and so it's a, it's a time-lapse of, of its, uh, which shows its trajectory. And this, and these are two photos taken from of course, uh, light pollution free locations. And the first is Ecuador, which is a, a country very close to the equator. So it's a low latitude region. And you can see how the paths of the stars are almost perpendicular to the horizontal plane or the horizon. And here you can see Alaska on the right, which is a high latitude region. And so the paths of the stars are centered around a point which is much higher above the horizon. So what we're going to, what, what I was sort of curious about is how can you, um, if I give you a particular place, could you tell me the trajectory of a particular star when viewed from that location? 
So yeah, that's the problem statement. Okay. So I mean, this is this is quite fascinating. I mean, we can try to guess what will be it be like if you are in the North Pole, or you know, at some latitude, uh, maybe between Alaska and here. Uh, in you know what it will be in Bangalore, say versus Delhi, right? So those kind yeah. of things would be interesting, and uh, I mean, I would sincerely ask the audience to you know ponder about that and think how that will look. So, what all did you explore, and how did you go about it? Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I sort of break break down step by step how you can solve this problem, including uh, some of like my thought process. So firstly, you have to use, a, in, in order to understand the apparent path of the star, you need to understand that you are, uh, that it's not actually a star which is moving, right? The star is a fixed point in space. And the star appears to be moving because the earth is rotating and you are on the rotating earth, correct? So it's very hard to understand as you're on a spinning ball, where does the star appear to be in your sky when your entire perspective is, is changing? So what, what's, a, what's a very standard trick in astronomy is to use the idea of a, re, of a reference frame where you always consider yourself to be fixed in space and everything else to be moving. Um, so you, you may have seen some variation of this uh, sort of joke, how many of profession X does it take to accomplish task Y? So um, yeah, in, in, the, in the context of astronomy, we use, the, we use this idea where we always, we, instead of thinking of the earth as rotating, we think of the earth as fixed and the universe as rotating in the opposite direction around the, about the earth. So um, yeah, the earth spins from west to east about its axis. But if you were to pretend the Earth was fixed, then an equivalent way of viewing this is to think of the universe as spinning around the Earth in the opposite direction. So now I can consider that I'm just a fixed observer, let's say, at this point in Mexico, and the sky is moving around me, and it's rotating about what axis would it be rotating about? Maybe you can put in comments if you uh, have an idea. What axis would the universe be rotating about? That's the, that's the question, right? So um, this is sort of a um, video which might demonstrate that change in perspective. So we, we, take, we treat the universe as rotating about the Earth. Um, nice. I think this explains quite a bit. Yeah. Um, okay, can, can, am I still audible? Is it, still? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so the question is, what is the axis of the universe's rotation, right? So the Earth has an axis, and it's the Earth spins about this axis. So, it, so it, the universe obviously would have to spin about the same axis that the uh, that's the Earth's axis of rotation. So it passes through the South Pole and the North Pole, and you can see along the side of the image here we mark latitude. So this is sixty degrees south because the angle between the equator and the point over here is sixty degrees, and it's south of the equator. So. So each point on the Earth has a latitude, and the and the axis pass, passes through the South Pole, which is at 90 degrees South latitude, and the North Pole, which is the point at 90 degrees North latitude. So hopefully you all remember this in some some way from school. Um, now the now the thing is, um, rather than thinking of the axis as a line, we can actually think of the axis of rotation as a direction. Because um, the Earth is very, very small compared to its distance to distant stars, which is we're considering distant stars for the moment. 
And the Earth is very small compared to its distance from those stars. They're pretty much at infinity. So the so so when we so basically um, all parallel lines from the Earth point in the same direction, and so they can be treated as a single axis. Um, so this is the axis of rotation through the south and north pole of the Earth, as is any other parallel line. So the universe will appear to rotate about that direction um, in the sky. So now this is a sort of the view of an alien looking at the Earth from very far away. What would they see? They they would uh, or what would they see the Earth rotating? Uh, or, or, the, or if they were to consider the Earth fixed, they would see the universe rotating about this axis. But the question is, in your local sky, where is this direction located? Because that can help you identify um, that that can help you determine the path of the of. Uh, the, the circles which the uh, stars trace that uh, that will help you determine what those circles are centered at, what axis they are centered at. Okay. Um, okay. So before before we get in before we can before we can determine what the rotation looks like from a local point of view, like in my local sky, let's first understand how uh, where our local celestial direction uh, local directions lie and where the celestial directions lie. So celestial north is defined as the direction pointing from the south pole towards the north pole and going upwards into space. So that's the celestial north direction. So any point on Earth, that par a line parallel to this green line is celestial north. And local north, of course, lies along the Earth. So it's tangent to the Earth. So the local north direction is sort of the direction which I would tell you to walk if I wanted you to get to the North Pole. So I would say walk due north. And that's a vector which is tangent to the Earth and along the Earth's surface. So the question is, how far above local north is the center of rotation? So you, if you remember in Ecuador, it was very close to the horizon, so very close to local north. Whereas as you go farther north of the equator, celestial north the, it, it becomes more separated from local north. Um, so from a local view, you can see over here in red local north, which is your due north direction, and celestial north, which is the center of rotation of the universe from our perspective, from the fixed Earth perspective. So, I mean, if I understand this correctly, local north is basically as you are walking or moving along Earth. Whereas yes. the celestial north is kind of like the fixed point in space. And it's like the pole star polaris or something, you know, which is kind of fixed and, you know, everything rotates around it. Yes, yes, that, that's a good point. So actually here in this image, you can see one star does not move at all. So that, that star is actually polaris. And it's the star that's vertically above the Earth's axis. So Polaris is located in the direction of this green arrow over here. So, um, yeah. So, so celestial north is that is, is that fixed point in the sky that doesn't move, and local north is the direction along the Earth's uh, surface that would take you north. Um, yeah. So, okay. So the question is, what is this angle between celestial north and local north? So. Maybe by now you have a guess um, on, as to what this angle would be. Um, I mean, so it, it actually increase with latitude. Yes. So th this angle is actually the latitude. So if you're at the equator, local north, the pole star is on the horizon for you. Whereas if you're not very far north of the equator, let's say at the north pole, the pole star would be vertically above. And, it, and the farther north you go from the equator, the farther north the pole star would rise above your local horizon. So in the southern hemisphere, you have a, you don't have a very bright star marking this location, but if you do the time lapse, you can still see that the uh, astronomical parts are centered on some point in the south, in the southern sky. But we, let's consider the northern sky for, for the purposes of this, just for simplicity, okay? So in the northern hemisphere, your pole star is elevated above the horizon by the angle, which is the latitude of the location. So let's just look at a mathematical proof of that fact. So let's suppose this is the equatorial plane. So OE over here is the direction of the equator. 
and O and O L over here is the vector pointing from the so O is the center of the Earth, and O L is the vector pointing from the center of the Earth to your location. So the angle between O L and O E is your latitude, which is marked here as pi, and the and so L N prime is your local sorry your celestial north is L N prime, and L T is your local north. So why is L T perpendicular to O L? That's the first question. Well. Lt, if you think about it, is tangent to the Earth's surface, correct? So Lt has to be perpendicular to the uh, the radial vector from the center of the Earth to your location. So therefore, you get a right angle there. And of course, Ot is perpendicular to Oe because the axis of rotation is defined is perpendicular to the equator. Um, so Ot is the direction of celestial north, as is Ln prime. Both are celestial north because they're parallel. So the question is, what is this angle T L N prime? That's the angle between local north L N prime. Sorry, uh, T L N prime is the angle between celestial north, which is L N prime, and local north, which is L T. Um, yeah. So I mean, I can see that there is a lot of connection with parallel lines, transversal, and things, which I think. You know, anybody in middle school level can figure it out. Yeah. So yeah, you have to use the main facts are right angle triangles and parallel lines with a transversal. So notice that this angle T O L is ninety minus five, right? Um, which which means that O L T because it's a right triangle. This is ninety minus Correct. five, so this becomes five over here. Um, OTL, yeah, and because OTL and TLN prime are um, interior alternate angles, if I remember correctly, yeah. So that means that they have to be equal in magnitude. So you can see that um, the angle between celestial north and local north is the same as the latitude of the place. Right. Right. So that's the proof of that fact. So yeah, that answers the question of. How do the stars move? In a very generic sense, if I give you a lat, I say, okay, Toronto, Canada, that's forty-three degrees north. So the cent, so the center of rotation is forty-three degrees above the horizon. Bangalore is thirteen degrees north. Center of rotation would be around thirteen degrees above the horizon. So, and if you are the North Pole, then all the stars appear to move um, in circles which are parallel to your horizontal plane, because celestial north would be vertically upwards. Okay. So that's sort of the first part. That sort of answers the gives you some. It's sort of the first part of our problem. Generally speaking, how do the stars move? So now we can go to the problem of how does a specific star move? That's the second step, right? So if you have a specific star, and we're going to consider distant stars, so not the sun, because um, the Earth's position changes relative to the sun over the course of a year, but the Earth's position doesn't change relative to distant stars, which are several light years away. So those stars can, as you can assume, to be always fixed at the same point relative to the Earth, or, or yeah, more or less, because stars move very slowly, so on and so forth. So we can assume that distant stars are fixed in position, at least over the course of our lifetimes. They're going to trace roughly the same path every day, right? So okay, let's say in blue, uh, the, the, so the, the blue circle you see at the top over here is some specific distant star, and when, you, when the universe rotates around the Earth, if you'll recall, we're considering the Earth fixed and the universe rotating. So the blue star is going to trace this circle about the Earth. And the angle um, between the, the, the celestial north direction and the vector in the direction of this star is always constant. And that's, a, that's an angle alpha. So earlier we had phi, which is a local, which is, which is not the same. So don't get confused between those two. This is this is an angle that is a function of the star, not a function of your location. Okay, so regardless of where you are on Earth, this angle will always remain the same, alpha. Um, and so the question is, if you know this angle, uh, the angle is a proper is a property of the star. It's depend. It's uh, so for Polaris, for Polaris, alpha is zero because Polaris is above the celestial north direction, and for other stars, the angle will be non-zero. So if you know this angle, can you determine the path, apparent path of the star? That's the question. So um, 
The answer is yes. So here the green arrow again is celestial north. It points towards the fixed star Polaris. And the blue arrow points towards the star which is moving across the sky um, from our perspective on Earth. And alpha is the angle between celestial north and that's and the vector in the direction of that star. So you can see over here, angle between green and uh, that should be blue. But the angle between celestial north and the star is alpha. And here, angle between celestial north and the star is uh, again alpha. So um, yeah, that that's the sort of second part of the problem. Now, 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 I can, now you can look up the North Pole separation. This is called a North Pole separation because it's the angle of separation from celestial north. And if I, uh, so if I give you a star like say Sirius, you could look up the North Pole separation of Sirius and therefore you could sort of, you could, you could say, okay, in Bangalore, I know where due north is. I know where celestial north is 13 degrees above that. And then using my knowledge of the North Pole separation for Sirius, I can plot Sirius's path across the sky. Okay. Um, so this is just, okay, so this is the next um, sort of concept, which is that stars rise and set. So it's not just the sun that rises and sets, stars rise and set. Because the earth is the earth is not transparent. So if we, if we just go back a couple of slides to, to this over here, you can see that this star towards the edge of the image is setting below the horizon and it's rising above the horizon, right? So that, that's simply because the circle is large enough to um, uh, intersect with the horizontal plane. So you can also understand why stars rise and set from a celestial view of the, of, of the rotation, which is that whenever, the, which is that when the universe is rotating around the earth, if I'm at a particular location, whenever the star goes behind me, so sort of on the other side, if of the earth, I, I'm no longer able to see it. Um, yeah, so this star, for example, disappears below the horizon of the observer as it goes towards the... Um, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So here you can see um, a more a, a, a broader view, sort of. So, so uh, this is let's say I'm I, uh, I'm flying in uh, an airplane, and and I'm and this is the this this gray um, circle over here is the entire horizon of of the observer who's standing um, here. So at, at the beginning of this dotted line is where the the observer is standing at the center of the gray circles. And the gray circle marks their horizon, okay? And so the north, if you're in the northern hemisphere, let's say in Hawaii, the north celestial pole, that means the direction of Polaris, celestial north, lies 20 degrees above your horizontal plane. We've established that. And the stars are going to go in circles about, uh, are about this axis of rotation. So uh, the vector connecting you to the north celestial pole, that direction, is the axis of rotation and everything rotates about that. Now, in, now, if you're at the equator, the north celestial pole, which is Polaris, lies on your horizon. And so the stars trace perpendicular paths to the horizon. And in the southern hemisphere, um, the south celestial pole is above the horizon. So you can't see Polaris anymore. Polaris is below your horizon. But above your southern horizon, you can see the center of rotation, which is the south celestial pole. And the stars trace circles about that center of rotation. So now, if the, if the north pole separation of a star is very small, like look at this star over here, very close to the north celestial pole. If its separation is small and you're in the northern hemisphere, the star doesn't really dip below the horizon. It always, it just goes in a circle about that point above the horizon. Whereas stars with, which have a large north pole separation, um, they dip below the horizon for a much longer part of the 24 hour cycle. So obviously the, the complete circle is 24 hours. And um, hopefully this should give you some intuition in, into what the night sky would actually look like from three different locations on Earth. Um, does that sort of make sense? Hopefully. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you were 
close to the equator, then all the stars rise and uh, set. But yes. if you are close to the horizon, then I mean, I mean, what I'm getting at looking at that picture is that if you are close to the horizon, then only stars with very small alpha will not set or rise. They will throughout be visible. But if you are, uh, uh, so for example, if we look at this picture of 20 degree north, then possibly anything with alpha, any star with alpha greater than 20 will probably uh, have a rise and fall, rise and set. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So if you're yeah. 20 degrees north, yeah, if you're yeah. 20 degrees north, then any star which is above 20 degrees alpha will set below the horizon at some point, yeah. at least for a little bit. So this... So, so a star which is exactly alpha equals 20 will just skim the northern horizon and then right. rise back. Right. Yeah. Quite fascinating. Okay. Yeah. And it, it's also, it also foreshadows um, some of the stuff we're going to be talking about, about the midnight sun. So that's. Oh, okay. Let's, so uh, let's get to the suns then. Yes. Okay. So, so far we've been talking about distant stars, stars which are far from the earth and which have a fixed trajectory through the sky over the course of the year. But I think the, the final part of sort of this analysis, we, we want to look at the sun. So for us on Earth, the sun is much more important to us. I think for the vast majority of humanity than random stars, although those are interesting as well. So um, the thing is the Earth is the Earth doesn't just rotate. It also revolves, right? It revolves around the sun. And so the sun's position relative to the Earth changes because, the, uh, because of course, um, the Earth is on one side of the Sun, then the Earth is on the other side of the Sun. So, so, so um, the, the trajectory of the Sun, or rather the Sun's alpha, changes over the course of the year. So alpha is a concept that helps. So if I know the Sun's alpha at a particular point in the year, let's say I know the Sun's alpha on October 1st, then I can trace the path of the Sun on October 1st using the analysis we just, we've just shown, right? But the problem is, how do I know what the Sun's alpha is if it's keeping on changing, it's not a fixed number I can look up because it changes over the course of the year. That's the next part of our problem. So let's sort of get some intuition as to why does alpha change for the sun. So you might have seen this, hopefully you remember this picture from school. So this shows the earth rotating and revolving. So the yellow um, circle here is the earth's revolution around the sun. So actually this yellow, the, the plane which contains the yellow circle is called the ecliptic. So all the planets actually revolve around the sun in that plane, um, which, may, which makes the path of the planets is also an interesting thing to study, but we won't cover it today. Um, but yeah, so the Earth rotates around the sun in this plane. And, and on the right, you can see the view of the, uh, of the Earth on June 21st. So on June 21st, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, right? Um, which is why you have summer in the northern hemisphere, which is where we are. Um, and on December 22nd, which is your winter solstice for the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. So that's why you experience winter if you're on the northern hemisphere in December. And also that the northern hemisphere of the earth gets more daylight in summer and less daylight in winter. That's why days are longer in summer and um, shorter in winter. So the so thing is we can actually... Today the earth is in the uh, right side picture right oh yeah today is summer solstice yes that's that's it. so so today the earth is yeah on the right side picture along yeah this direction here yeah so that means today we have the longest day of the year in the northern hemisphere so if you look up sunrise and sunset times and then you subtract the two times you'll find that the um, length of day peaks today and then it will decrease going into July, August, and so on. Yeah. So okay. So we can. So so again. So we're going to be uh, from our perspective. We want the Earth's axis vertical, um, because it helps us conceptualize things easier. So we just rotate this image. Okay, twenty three and a half degrees um, clockwise to make the Earth's axis vertical. Why twenty three and a half degrees? Because the angle of tilt between the Earth's axis and its plane of revolution is sixty six and a half degrees. So this is a 
a, a fact of the universe that you have to take for granted. I have no idea why. Somebody can let me know. But it's the, the Earth is tilted 66 and a half degrees with respect to its plane of revolution. So if we tilt the image clockwise 23 and a half degrees, now the Earth's axis becomes vertical. And you can see that the sun is south of the equatorial plane on December 22nd. And today, the sun is north of the equatorial plane because the equatorial plane is now horizontal. So this, this should tell us that alpha, which is the angle between the north celestial pole and the sun, is 66 and a half degrees today. Today, alpha is 66 and a half degrees. Whereas in on December 22nd, which is winter solstice, alpha will be 100 and... Um, 13.5 degrees, yeah, 113.5 degrees. So basically um, 180 degree minus 66 and a half degrees. Yes, 180 minus 66, oops, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that will be the value of alpha in winter. Okay, so now that we know the value of alpha in summer and winter, um, we can at least plot the path of the sun on three days of the, on four days of the year, okay, with this information, with, with a little bit of extension, I, I suppose. Um, so, this is a, a view of the local, again, this, the, the circle that you see here is the horizontal plane. And we and so this, this shows the path of the sun on the June solstice, which is today again, um, here in red, on December solstice in blue. And right in the average of those two is the, are the equinoxes. So on the equinoxes, the sun lies on the equatorial plane. So therefore, um, the sun's alpha on the equinox is 90 degrees. So you can see that it's 90. So if you took this vector from this point here to the north celestial pole and um, to the sun's location um, on the equinox, those vectors are all 90 degrees um, because that's the equatorial plane and that's the north celestial pole. So this, this circle which contains the sun on the equinox is the equatorial plane, the plane that contains that circle. Okay. Um, and what is, hopefully you guys can recall, what is this angle between due north, the local north direction, and the north celestial pole, right? That is... Isn't that the north uh, something separated? No, that, that is the latitude of the place. Oh, um, okay. Yes, so alpha is the north pole separation. So alpha is the separation between right. the north celestial pole vector and the sun. Right, um, but uh, so so the, the sun is tracing a path of on a given day of the year. The sun traces a path of constant alpha, right? Because alpha is not changing over that day. At least we're assuming it doesn't. So uh, uh, today, alpha is sixty six point five degrees. So we know the position of the sun relative to the earth, and so the sun is going to trace this path, which is sixty six and a half degrees from the north celestial pole. But the north celestial pole is phi, which is our latitude, from the local northern horizon. So this, this uh, circle is the horizontal plane, and the vector in the direction n is the local northern horizon. Um, does that make sense? Anything I should elaborate on? Yeah, so this angle between the two lines, that's the phi, that's the latitude. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I mean, this kind of prompts that if phi is pretty large, okay, then there is a chance that the red circle or the blue circle uh, may not uh, intersect the horizontal plane. Yes, yes. So let, let's see what happens as alpha becomes larger. So let's increase alpha. Uh, sorry. Let's see what happens as phi becomes larger. We're increasing the latitude. So right, not alpha. Right. As, as phi becomes larger, let's see how the view changes. So we're going to increase our latitude. So we're going to move to a far north location. So uh, now the north celestial pole is way above the horizon. You can see the northern horizon. Right. And so I mean, the June... See, it, it, it almost rises as soon as it sets. Yes, yes. So that's why if, 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 I'm, if, I'm, if, if I'm an observer standing here at a far north location in June, which is today, uh, if I'm supposing I'm in Alaska today, this is going to be the path of the sun. So it's going to just rise east of due north, just east of due. So the sun, again, another myth is the sun doesn't rise due east. So always. So here you can see the sun rises just east of due north, takes this long circle through the sky, 
and just skims the just skims below the northern horizon before rising again the next day. So that's a very long day and a very short night. When the sun is below the horizon, we call that night. Yes. So okay. Yeah, so I think then you pointed out something very important that you know, as we go from summer to winter, the sun will rise and set not due east, but probably or due west, but rather from northeast or somewhere closer to north, and then it, mm -hmm. it will shift through the year all the way, I mean, towards south. Yeah. So it will, then it will be a movement from like northeast or north to southeast and south, depending on yeah. the latitude. And you, you can even see this in Bangalore. So when I look at the sunrise from my breakfast table, I can see it uh, in summer, it migrates very far north of, so so say I have a window, then somehow it will rise to the north side of that window. And in the winter, it will rise closer to the south side. So it's a very noticeable migration, even from Bang, uh, even from Bangalore, you can see it, it migrate quite noticeably, the, the, the direction of sunrise. Yeah. Okay. So if we increase the latitude even further, I think you can guess what's going to happen by now, which is that this red circle that the sun traces will not touch the horizon at all. It will remain right. above the horizon. So this is a view looking due north from a very high latitude location. And you can see the sun doesn't touch the horizon at all. It just, it just stays above the horizon even at midnight. So midnight is defined as the, the time of day when the sun is at its lowest point. At least that's astronomical midnight. Might not be exactly 12 a.m. because of time zones. But if we, but let's, from an astronomical point of view, we're going to say midnight is the time when the sun is at its lowest point in the sky. So it's just this red. So, so it looks like a sunrise at midnight. The sun sets at midnight and rises at midnight. Um, so that's why it becomes, and, and so because of uh, light scattering in the atmosphere, the sun appears red at that location, but it doesn't set. So you have 24 hours of daylight. Um, so this is what the midnight sun looks like. And something which uh, I leave for the audience to sort of think about is how, uh, if I give you a latitude north of what we call the Arctic Circle, north of 66 and a half degrees, the sun, there'll be at least one day of the year when the sun doesn't set. So, for example, today is summer solstice. So, at the latitude 66 and a half degrees, the sun will just skim the horizon and rise. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, the question is, if I give you a latitude, let's say 75 degrees, how many days of the year will the sun be above the horizon? That's the question. Or what fraction of the year has complete daylight? But then there'll be some fraction of the year which has both um, uh, some uh, some amount of night and day and then in winter you'll have complete darkness because the sun circle will completely set will this this circle will completely disappear below the horizon yes so, right right yeah and so that's I think those are quite fascinating questions yeah so it's it, it, so what kind of tools would you need to answer that question so we know you would need of course the at a given time of year to know that what is alpha? What is the North Pole separation of the sun? And you could use that to determine perhaps the path. So it, more details are there in the paper if you read it. But let me just sort of outline um, some of the further thinking that you can do to get a mathematical formula for the sun's path, which can help with questions like these and somewhat more evolved than these as well. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we will have to, so now let's just get quickly look at uh, some of the math. I think my whole thing, whole thing should be visible, right? Um, yeah, it is yeah. visible. Okay, so the so we have to define some axes. So we have to define x, y, and z axis. So we won't define our, we don't have to define our y axis for this problem directly. So we can just define our x axis is the direct. Okay, okay, just um, before we get into that, one quick thing which is that instead of considering the Earth to revolve around the Sun, we do the same trick. We fix the Earth in place and we consider the Sun to revolve around the Earth. And again, it'll if the Earth is revolving around the Sun counterclockwise, you can actually consider that equivalent to fixing the Earth in place and assuming the Sun revolves around the Earth counterclockwise again. So, um, just, so you can just sort of play with your two fingers and with one is the Earth and one is the Sun and think about that a little bit. But 
Okay, so we're going to define coordinates to, for our convenience. So the x-axis is the direction of the sun, so the vector pointing from the Earth to the sun on summer solstice, which is June 21st. And the z-axis is the direction perpendicular to the sun's plane of revolution. So that's actually the Earth's plane of revolution, which we treat as a sun's plane of revolution. N is the direction of celestial north. Uh, S is the direction of the sun at a given time of year. So tau represents the time of year. I won't go into the details, but... Um, the thing is, and, and if you want to find the angle between N and S, you can use some vector geometry, specifically a dot product, and you can get the angle alpha, which is the angle between N on celestial north direction and S to determine exactly at a given time of year, what is the north pole separation of the sun. Um, so if you want the full details of the math, you can look at the paper to so you refer to that. But so the kappa here, that is 66 and a half degrees, right? Yes, yes. Kappa is 66 and a half degrees. I tried to do it in the most general way possible. So let's, right. let's yeah. So if you had, if the, if the Earth was tilted at a different angle, then could you calculate the North Pole separation and so on? And um, yeah, so the, the nice thing about doing it more generally with, cap, with a variable kappa is you can now say, what would the sun's path look like from the planet? Venus or the planet Mars, because its 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 rotational axis will be um, oblique to its uh, to the ecliptic by a different amount. Right. Yeah. Ecliptic means the the dotted circle here, the right. plane of revolution. Yeah. So for okay. our purpose, kappa is fixed, and I'll, mm -hmm. uh, the tau varies throughout the uh, throughout the year, and as yes. a result. You know, uh, we can see the last formula where cosine of alpha is defined with help of cosines of tau and kappa. So cosine kappa remains fixed as long as we are in the in Earth, right? Yes. On our own yes. home planet. So as tau varies, then uh, that basically changes the cosine of the, the alpha. So that's how they are related. Yeah. Okay. So we yeah, strongly and... encourage our audience, if you haven't read the uh, Aman's article, so to you know go back and read it uh, now, because now we think we with this webinar it will be make a lot more sense. And I would like to thank Aman a lot, especially for all these cool pictures. Uh, many students find geography and this kind of things pretty complicated because it's 3D and perspective changes, etc. But I believe these pictures help quite a bit. So, mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this is something that you did on your own. This is not part of a syllabus or anything, right? Yeah. And, uh, and very clearly, you seem to have enjoyed it, you know, have fun with it, etc. So what would you like to tell, uh, you know, those who are in school, you know, let's say at the secondary level, 9, 10, 11, 12, or even younger? Yeah, so um, I think as I think as humans, like we have a sort of curiosity that's very innate, right? Children are very curious about the world. And I think that's some, the sad thing is a lot of a lot of children, they sort of, as they grow older, they sort of lose that curiosity because learning becomes more about how do I get good marks in the next exam? I mean, for regardless of what your target is, maybe some people are like, how do I get full marks in the exam? Some people are saying, how do I pass the exam? Depending on their, uh, uh, depending on how, but, but, but it's all exam oriented as, as to, in terms of the exam is your target. Whereas I feel like the exam is just, should really just be a hurdle that you have to clear and you should, and you should never let that kind of the stress around that or or fear of being judged for doing badly on an exam kill your curiosity for the subject so make sure that um okay for the days before the exam you should study for the exam but rest of the year whenever you're thinking or studying these things uh let your curiosity take you down whatever rabbit hole um you want to go down always um think about uh how how can i if i look at the world around me there's so many problems that sort of jump out. This is just one, one example of that, but you can, there, there are so many ways you can apply basic math and physics. 
sometimes you this problem is particularly nice because it lends itself to sort of simple mathematical modeling but um i think there are like uh, if you are let's say you are um or let's say you're on a carousel which is spinning around you can think about the physics of how does the center how, how does this centripetal force uh, and the centrifugal the, the fictitious centrifugal force keep you in um that constant spinning motion so um whatever so so think you can as, as you as you get pressed back on on a, on a ride at a carnival you get pressed back at your seat think about what's actually exerting the forces on you that's a good way that you can sort of build your intuition for physics um so just just let your curiosity take you wherever it does and um the exams will work themselves out if you're truly passionate about what you're studying and um yeah i think the the goal of a, a good teacher or a good parent is just to aid the student in in doing that so my parents have always supported me and and, and at times i probably asked questions which probably annoyed them a lot because like they had a tiring day of work and then i would pester them with questions but um you know they 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 uh, sort of tolerated me and they encouraged me to ask more questions and i think that's a good thing in, that that's something i'm very thankful for and uh, um yeah so would you say that uh, parents and teachers should encourage uh, students to ask questions regardless of how annoying that can be yeah yeah i mean i i mean this this everyone has like the limits for how much they can tolerate but i think generally speaking in the long run if you encourage if, if you are as patient as possible and you and 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 i don't think i think maybe that there's either there's no such thing as a bad question or bad questions are at the very least very rare so i think most questions are are actually quite good and um you should and, and they should be encouraged but one um, of the things that adults in general are quite scared of is like what if they don't know the answer um well not knowing the answer i think yeah I, a lot of people are um they sort of have a fear of of uh, not knowing you know which is sort of i think um a natural thing to feel but it's also thrilling to not know something sometimes because it means that there's something out there for you to discover and if you know everything then like what's what's the point you know there's not there's no questions left to be answered then there's no real, the, the entire the entire thrill of science is living on the boundary between knowledge and ignorance and being comfortable with not knowing things i think is very important um or yeah but yeah I mean, something if i understand you correctly you almost seem to hint that teachers and parents should go on an at on an adventure with you know the children and students uh, an adventure into the unknown so to speak yeah yeah so it's so a definitely teachers which who who bring up questions which they don't know the answers to i i feel like actually it can really inspire students more i think because this because um let's say i i am a i'm an eighth grade student okay i i don't know a lot there's a lot i don't know i've never touched a calculus book in my life but if i see that my teacher also doesn't know things then i can sort of become more comfortable with the fact that uh i don't know everything that there is to be known but some day uh i can but if i keep if i keep working hard i i still won't know everything that there is to be known but at least i can know more than i do today and that and the journey itself is very fulfilling you know of learning oh, that's a things. very important thing that teacher not knowing everything can be of such motivation and comfort to a student i think this is something that you know all teachers listening in should pay attention to um there is one more question like let's say there are students who are motivated to explore and have adventures or let's say even there are teachers who want to take the students on an adventure where can they get you know good material reference materials or maybe certain websites which can you know uh, provide them food for thought hmm. so okay firstly i think in terms of reference materials um 
the, the thing is, if, if uh, there are there are many sources. So, for example, YouTube is an amazing source of uh, of of fascinating questions. Channels like Three Blue One Brown. I don't know if some of you might have heard of it. Uh, it's run by uh, someone called Grant Sanderson. So you can look him up. But he basically does this sort of explorational mathematics content on YouTube. So he poses a very interesting question, and he'll talk about how approaches are solving it. Um, like, I think one question he talked about was the shortest path between two points in a gravitational field. So if I have a, um, if I have a ball and it's falling from point A to point B, how could I construct the shortest possible, the, the, the path of least time, the path which the ball takes the least amount of time to get from point A to point B? And problems like that. And he motivated through, and he's connected to all kinds of things about concepts regarding light and and the evolution of the field of calculus and all kinds of um, other uh, branches of math. But the thing is, even I guess the question is, uh, uh, sources like that and say Brilliant is another good source, but even they get their inspiration from the world around them, right? Everybody who is um, create, who is coming up with a repository of, of good questions, they can only come up with that through their experience of the world and having interesting discussions with other people. And so I think ultimately a good source of, of uh, questions to study is just looking around you and being curious, I think, mm, as well. So basically be on the lookout for uh, adventures, you know, seek out possibilities and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I frankly uh, remember one evening during my college days, a uh, few hours spent, you know, just watching the sky or just having a chat with some, some of my friends under the sky and observing, you know, that motion that you saw with so many concentric circles and all, right? And um, it does did explain certain things, like certain stars, why I couldn't see them in the early evening, but I could see them late in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, just like, you know, because they would rise like this. So early evening, they will be down and late evening, they're up. Mm -hmm. So you can see them over the crowded city horizon. Yeah. Also, even, even though the path of the stars is constant, the stars you can see at different times of the year are different because the sun blocks out half the sky, right? So actually right. knowing the sun, so if you want to know, can I see a particular star? And then the question is, when the star is above the horizon, is the sun below the horizon? That's the question. Ah. Yeah. Yes, yes. That is why, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. certain stars are there only during certain months and not throughout the year yeah so so yeah. if you look at each circle of light in the sky there can actually be multiple stars on that mm. same circle of circle of light tracing the same path so the, so besides the alpha which is one coordinate that i didn't that locates that streak of light you also have a second coordinate called the right ascension so you have to make sure that the right ascension is different enough from the sun and yeah there's a, there's an entire separate coordinate system that you have to develop for that. Yeah. Okay, now I will sound extremely greedy and you mm -hmm. don't have to commit, you know, now, but I have to ask you, since you're talking about something, you know, related and all those things, can we expect another article? Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, I mean, um, I definitely could like try to write more about um, this, but I, I, I guess um, I have to think about what to write about. Um, and then if I think of something interesting, I can definitely submit it. Yeah, because um, this, this sounds quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, also, let me uh, ask maybe one, uh, one of the last few questions. Is there any application to all this? I mean, obviously, this is very interesting, very fun to uh, know and explore and all of that, especially since they don't need too much of higher mathematics. I know it can be pretty much tackled with if you have a sense of angles and you can, you know, define things well, you have a sense of three dimension and all of that. Um, 
but is there any application like practical real life application of these yeah so um we live in a we live in a world that's changing um mm -hmm. so i think we uh, i think it's a global challenge to tackle climate change and so on so we're trying to move towards renewable sources of energy and solar power is a big one especially in tropical countries where you, where solar panels are a very economically effective way of installing power capacity power capacity so solar panels can can be of two types you can have a solar panel that tracks the sun or you can have a solar panel that's fixed in place and those sort of present different um problems but both of them require what we've gone through in today's talk so so let's say i have I actually have a friend who who is building a solar vegetable dryer for farmers to use the nice thing about solar panel is you can have it relatively decentralized not like a nuclear power plant so yeah so so and 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 it, and it, it, it and he can't afford to install a, a tracker to the solar panel because the um, the equipment required to do that was, is too expensive so um it's really the, the the question is i have a fixed um solar panel where how do i orient it which direction do i orient it to optimize the power generation and power generation is simply a function of the sun's elevation above the horizon and the hours of sunlight so so for, so if the sun is vertically uh, vertically above at the zenith then or, or vertically above the solar panel rather then it's then its incident rays are most concentrated and if it's um sort of at a at a more at a larger deviation from the normal vector then less solar pan power is incident on the solar panel so if you want to optimize this i'll pose it as a question again for you guys to ponder if i give you the latitude of the place let's say bangalore is 13 degrees north what's the optimal orientation for a fixed solar panel that could be a very direct um application of this problem um okay so so for this okay i i again we're assuming an equal number of hours of sunlight throughout the year which is not true for bangalore so bangalore has um monsoon which is half the year is a wet season half the year is a dry season and so the amount of sunlight varies so maybe that will change your answer somewhat you might have to factor that in do some simulations but i guess the first step is pretend none of that exists mathematically idealize the problem and solve it and then you can factor in those things as, as well uh meteorological changes and so on and yeah that that could be a very useful problem to solve yeah and uh, since you know solar power is coming in quite strongly um you can see where this knowledge will get used so i mean thank you very very much for this very uh, for this article as well as being with us today with all these great pictures and you know explanations and all and i strongly uh, encourage all the audience uh, to read the article and also think about what avan said that uh, you know as adults we do get pretty scared uh, if you know we are asked something that we don't know answers to but the way he kind of posed it is that if we don't have the answer that can actually be a very enabling factor for the young ones for our students or our children and so we shouldn't hesitate to admit that we don't know and and probably ideally we shouldn't stop there and try to go on an adventure of knowing together with uh, children and students after all you know knowledge is created together it's not something you can spoon feed right so i mean thank you aman again for those very wise words and your perspective uh, we will see you all again next month in another at right angle webinar till then it's bye bye from us